Great. Thank you very much, Terry. Well, welcome, everybody. As Terry said, my name's Gavin, Gavin Predipini. And uh, yeah, some of you may be wondering, when Terry said that I'm the founder of the Cloud Appreciation Society, I hope some of you are wondering, what is that, the Cloud Appreciation Society? I'm going to explain a little bit about it, how it came about, why it exists. Um, but uh, I'm going to do so by showing you uh, a whole bunch of pictures of the sky. In fact, there are many of these, and all of these, I think, are images sent in by members of the Cloud Appreciation Society. And I want to just start with that. Before I even say anything about the society, I want to start with a couple of pictures of the sky and with a little reminder, maybe it's a reminder or maybe it's something you're not familiar with, that the sky you can think of as an ocean. I'm not the first to say this. It's an ocean, just like the oceans that we're familiar with, the, you know, the Pacific, the Atlantic. This is an ocean of gases. And this is an ocean that we live in. We live within the sky, not beneath it. We just happen to live on the ocean bed. And this um, ocean of air that we call our atmosphere, it has, um, it, there are many ways in which it is similar to the oceans that we're more familiar with. You can see wave formations appearing in this ocean of air, it's like these ones from satellite images, the waves are revealed by the clouds because the clouds are the one part of this ocean that we're able to see. I believe that uh, clouds are the most evocative and dynamic, poetic aspect of nature. And the funny thing is, it's a part of nature that so many of us become blind to because it's always there. Uh, it's a part of nature which is omnipresent and anything that's forever in our vision, it occupies half of our vision, the sky, anything that's always there, even if it is always changing like the sky is, it's something that we become a little bit blind to. I think we become blind to the sky. I think we become blind to the beauty of the sky. And I think this is a shame as I'm going to uh, try to demonstrate. I think that we, it, we would do well to reconnect with a kind of interest in the sky that many of us have when we're young. Um, I'll come to that maybe in a little bit, but when, uh, when we're young, perhaps we remember looking up at the sky and finding shapes in the sky. We have a slightly sort of nostalgic feeling about the sky. I think it's good to reconnect to that once we're adults, um, and I'll hope to demonstrate that uh, as we go through looking at some different cloud types. But it's for that reason that that um, the feeling that to connect to the sky is an important thing um, that I started the society, the Cloud Appreciation Society. Um, it. Um, is something to act as a tap on the shoulder, to act as a little reminder to us to spend a few moments with our head in the clouds. Um, and this is the reason, there are a few reasons why I think it's a good idea. One is um, to do with you slowing down. When you engage with the sky, you slow down. It's a narrative. The movements of the clouds is a narrative with no beginning and no end. So to engage with it is to slow down. Also to engage with it is to go into a kind of um, little dreamy state. Um, and I think that is important for your creativity because it's like the, 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 the um, subconscious part of your brain that's at work. Um, and it's also for good for us as a society, I think, to connect more to the sky because it's a part of nature we all share. It's the most egalitarian part of nature since everyone has a fantastic view of the sky, no matter where you are. 
even the most urban of environments, um, the sky is the last wilderness within easy reach. And for all these reasons, I started the Cloud Appreciation Society. Um, it was 15 years ago now that I started it. Um, and so I'm member number one. And uh, we now have something like 52,000 uh, members all around the world in 120 countries. Um, it, uh, they are all united in this uh, belief that the, the, the sky is um, something to be appreciated, that the clouds are um, a part of nature to celebrate. And uh, I started it almost uh, like almost on a whim, a friend of mine asked if I would like to give a talk about clouds at a festival in Cornwall here in England, down in the southwest. And because she knew that I liked to go on about clouds and I like to talk about the sky. I said, I'd love to do that. Um, uh, but, you know, this was a literary festival. And I said, I haven't written a book. Um, so, you know, I don't really know. She said, don't worry, don't worry. It's our first festival we're desperate for speakers and um so come on just give us a talk about you don't have to have a book and this was before i'd started any society or anything so my first talk i went out and i thought how do i get people to come along to a talk about the sky or a talk about clouds here in the uk people think there are rather too many of them around and um so people, if you think about it, it's written into the English language sometimes, negative aspects about the clouds or negative attitudes. Someone says there's a cloud hanging over you when you're kind of down or depressed, or if there's something bad in store, there's a cloud on the horizon. Um, so sometimes I was thinking I'm gonna be fighting against that negative, um, and I thought I'd just give the talk an unusual name. So I called it the Inaugural Lecture of the Cloud Appreciation Society, just because I thought that was a weird sounding name and I'd like to go to a talk like that, don't know what it would be, what would be in it. It definitely worked. Lots of people came along to the talk. It was totally full and they all came up to me afterwards and said, how do I join your society? I realized, well, it may have been kind of a lighthearted name, but actually, yeah, we do need a society. We do need something that reminds us of the beauty of the sky. And so that's how it came about. A few years later, I did do a book about the clouds and she asked me back to her literary festival. This time I came uh, dressed as a cloud. Uh, I, I thought I'd get a good laugh if I go on stage wearing a cloud outfit. Um, as you can see, um, yeah, those aren't my real legs on the top, um, the real legs. Yeah, real legs down below. Um, I uh, sort of came out onto stage wearing this cloud, gave the whole talk actually wearing that cloud. Um, I, I'm not wearing, the, I'm not sitting on a cloud right now, but um, you can imagine that I am if you would like. Uh, and I um, enjoyed wearing this cloud so much, it freaked out all the children at this um, festival um, who just kind of just looked me up and down. They couldn't work out what was going on with the legs and stuff like that. I wore it most of the day, actually, and um, did some, uh, you know, signed my book um, wearing it. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that is how the society came about. And as I say, we have, what, um, 52,000 members now. Um, the part of the country where membership is growing fastest is the United States of America. And I do wonder whether, when I hear people um, from the States talk about the society, they say um, it's the unifying quality of it that um, resonates right now. So we're going to get into talking about clouds, and I'm going to tell you about or introduce you to some of the characters of the sky. Just as many of you will know, um, with an organization like Prospect Heights, um, the, uh, what has been uh, the value of learning the names of animals and plants? To me, the same applies when it comes to the sky. Learning some of the names of clouds shifts our relationship with the sky. It's like when you go into a room, you know some of the names of the people in the room, you have a very different feeling about being in that room than you do when, you, when they're all kind of people you don't know uh, or don't know their names specifically. So when it comes to the sky, I like to teach people a few of the names and their Latin names, but we're not gonna get too freaked out about that. Before I do that, I'm going to just explain to you with a little animation that we did, kind of how clouds work 
It's um, a little animation called Welcome to the World of Clouds, and it is just to explain the basics of the science of them. So we we'll go straight into that now. Here we go. Welcome to the World of Clouds is what it's called. Happy cloud spotting indeed. So that's um, that's the basics of it. Um, that shows you kind of, uh, you know, like there's just sort of a, an overview of what's going on when a cloud forms. They um, being the, oh, look at this. Why have I gone, why has my face turned into, does my face seem to have gone invisible to you? Maybe I'm, um, is that right, Terry? Can you see my, has my face gone, uh, turned into, I've actually turned into a cloud, is that right? Or am I imagining that? Yes, uh, you have. Kind of like a invisible man. This is quite amazing, isn't it? I've literally turned into a cloud. Um, let me just see whether I, if I go back to here and come back. No, okay, so I'm gonna go, uh, it's interestingly it's showing um this is a new thing right you haven't been like this all the way through no it's it, it comes and goes gavin which is which is fine we understand it's probably due to the connection we have from england no i think it's due to the um green screen elements to it so what i'm going to do is just in um i'm just going to go in here in preferences and i think it is um, just a virtual background. And I think I just need to none. There we go. We can't have me turning into a cloud. That wouldn't work, I don't think. I'm going to talking about them, not being them. Right. Does that is that now looking right again, Terry? Yes. Perfect. Excellent. Um, the Invisible Man has returned to visibility and um, so yeah, that is giving you the basic idea. We're now going to start talking about the first of these characters of the sky that I want to uh, introduce you to and that is the Cumulus Cloud. The Cumulus Cloud is like, is like the sort of generic one. If you were to uh, close your eyes and think of a cloud, well, it's probably the cumulus that would come to mind. It's the Simpsons cloud, the one that forms on a sunny day. And as I say, it's like, um, it's like everyone's idea of a cloud. So it's got this Latin name, cumulus. Um, that is um, just, it just means a stack or a heap something solid, clumpy looking. These are the most solid looking of all the cloud formations. Um, and they form on top of thermals. So when the sun uh, warms the ground, 
a, um, uh, thermals rise off the sun warmed ground. These thermals like are uh, because the ground warms up a little, that warms the air above, and that causes the air to lift in invisible columns. And uh, when the air lifts, it expands. And whenever any gas expands, the, it cools. And that is really what causes a cumulus cloud to form. It's the lifting air rising of, of a thermal, it expands and cools, and some of the droplets in its, uh, that are some of the moisture that's in it forms into droplets, condenses into droplets. That's what we see as the cloud. So um, a cumulus uh, is, uh, uh, it's got a sort of solid edge to it. That's why um, it, uh, it, one reason why it looks solid is because uh, it's made up of lots of tiny, tiny droplets and plenty of them. And whenever there are uh, plenty of uh, little particles in a cloud, it looks um, solid. Uh, so because there are lots and lots and lots of droplets, the cloud looks like it's a solid thing. Of course, this is one of the beauties or one of the kind of intriguing aspects of clouds for children. They know that there's something odd about them. They're kind of like a thing. And yet they know, well, if you touched it, your hand would go through. And that's because of this sort of optical illusion. It's actually, of course, a collection of countless tiny things, little droplets, each just suspended, floated in the air, floating in the air like a moat of dust. But add them all together. If you add or added all the droplets together, say in this cloud, this cumulus cloud, it'll weigh about the same as 80 elephants. But they're not all added together into one big mass of water. They're in tiny particles, and those can float in the air easily. Um, and so, uh, but it's all the scattering of the sunlight by so many surfaces in that, uh, that of those particles, those little droplets, that makes the cloud appear solid and gives the cumulus its name, this uh, accumulation, this sort of um, solid uh, heap or stack. You can sometimes add a name to a um, uh, uh, one of these classifications. So you could add to cumulus, you could add fractus. If, well, it was a rather different stage in its life and it's beginning to fray at the edges like this one. Fractus is when the cumulus cloud is reaching perhaps the ripe old age of 15 minutes, something like that, uh, or perhaps when it's just being born. And at that, at those two stages, it has not the solid, crisp outer edges, these cauliflower edges. It frays at the sides. And that is when you, would, you could add the term fractus, cumulus fractus. I'll get out of the way, actually, because that's um, uh, getting in the way of the name. Cumulus fractus would be the name if you wanted to describe it at that stage. And that's often the case with these Latin names. You can kind of add a little bit more detail. And that um, appearance and disappearance of clouds, like that fractus stage when it's just forming or just dissipating, that, of course, it's the magic of clouds. It is the way that clouds can appear and disappear seemingly at will. And there's one simple, simple reason this magic happens in our atmosphere. It is this simple fact that water is a unique substance. Water is unique in the sense that it is the only substance naturally in three states, solid, liquid, and gas. On our planet, nothing else is within the normal, natural conditions of our planet. Nothing else is. We can see the droplets, the liquid form, as these clouds, these cumulus clouds, are droplets, liquid water. Ice crystals are high clouds. I'll come to those a little bit later. We can see them, but the gas form of water, known as water vapor, it's in every breath you breathe out, and it's invisible. Just one of the gases of our air, 
like oxygen, like nitrogen, and we can't see it. So water can change so easily from one of these forms to the other with just the slightest change in temperature. As we know, when we're in the, the, in the bathroom having a shower and you can see it mist up in there, gets a little bit warmer, more water in the air, atmosphere, and you can start to see the kind of fog in that room. Just the slightest changes in temperature and moisture content and the cloud changes from being invisible, the gas, to being visible as the droplets or being visible as the ice crystals. It's in a constant dance between visibility and invisibility. And that simple, unique property of water on our planet is what brings this magic of clouds and makes them such rich metaphors and inspirations for poets and artists um, throughout human culture. Okay, so let me get myself out of the way. That... Um, that cumulus cloud is one of the 10 main types. There are 10 main types of clouds. You know, if you want Latin names, I'll give you Latin names. Here they are. Um, but we're not going to get kind of too exhaustively going through these because it'll just um, get tedious. But um, cumulus there, you can see down and just in red there down towards the bottom. It's a low cloud, the low clumpy individual cloud. And cumulus, that word that means a stack or a heap or something solid in Latin, well, it's in some of the other ones. You can see it's also there in stratocumulus, that cloud showing next to it. And that one, stratocumulus, well, it's another clumpy cloud, but this time it's not so much the separated out ones, not the Simpsons clouds. Uh, it's when these clumpy clouds are kind of joined together. So it mixes two names. It mixes that cumulus part, um, which means clumpy, and stratus, and that is the Latin for a blanket. So when you've got a kind of clumpy cloud joined together in a layer, that is stratocumulus. Okay, so that is um, shows you that you can sometimes these names kind of combine together like that. And then there also is higher versions. You can see there, there's an alto cumulus. Well, the alto cumulus cloud is, it's like a clumpy one, but it's a bit higher up. It's a beautiful formation. Here is an example of alto cumulus. Well, it looks kind of similar. I mean, it's, it's clumpy like the cumulus one was, but wow, well, there are a few differences, aren't there? Um, what are the differences? Well, I suppose in one sense, it's, uh, uh, it is, you know, kind of got this regular appearance to it. But the other one is, you know, um, it, the clumps are smaller. They, they appear smaller. Well, if you were to go up in an aircraft, up in an airplane, as did Georgia O'Keeffe when she uh, painted uh, her series of um, cloud paintings, these huge canvases uh, in the 60s, and she um, viewed clouds from the window. Um, these are kind of stylized, but, you know, alto cumulus clouds, if you're up there, they're going to look a lot bigger than they do uh, all the way from down here on the ground. And that, in fact, is, so th this idea that they're smaller clumps is actually a little bit of a, um, well, it's a little bit of an optical illusion because alto cumulus clouds, they're about the same size as the cumulus ones nearby, but they're just further away. So they appear smaller. Um, so that's one thing. But the other thing about them uh, that sort of seems uh, jumps out as being different is what well, they are very regular. At least these examples appear in this kind of regular pattern. So this pattern is just one reason I think why it's a beautiful formation. And um, I did a little demonstration for the Weather Channel um, so at the Cloud Appreciation Society, we have a cloud of the month. Of course, we have a cloud of the month every month. And we, um, I would sometimes uh, check in with the Weather Channel in the States uh, and do a little sort of live video over Skype with them to talk about the cloud of the month. And when I did one about the Alto Cumulus cloud, I thought, well, it'd be good to demonstrate how this cloud forms to give an idea of why it has this regular appearance. 
to do that with a live demo. Uh, and I quite liked doing live demos, um, but it was a little bit kind of potentially tense doing it literally live over Skype with a camera uh, on TV in uh, uh, across the US. But here we go, I'm gonna show you it. I think that's coming up next. Let me just see uh, if I can show you this. Yeah, here we go, right, we've got the live demo. Um, and what I'm really trying to show you in this is the regularity. It forms as a result of something called convection cells. And I'm gonna demonstrate this uh, to the Weather Channel using a panini toaster, all right? I like to do demos using everyday stuff because um, it's more accessible that way. So I used a panini toaster to do this live demo to the Weather Channel. Here we go. There's a really beautiful, neat uh, demonstration that you can do in your own kitchen uh, to show. No, actually, wait a second. I've shown you the wrong one there. Just showing you the wrong video. I'm going to change that and I will show you, hopefully, this one instead. Beautiful weather there always. Well, time now to show off the cloud of the month, or in this case, maybe we should say cloudlets. Yeah, in fact, uh, <laughs> these cloudlets look like sheets of fleecy clumps here. They make up the alto cumulus cloud. There you go. And for more on the cloud of the month, we want to bring in Gavin Preacher Kinney, founder of the Cloud Appreciation Society. Uh, Gavin, good to see you. Joining us from Somerset, England. That's right. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Paul. Well, hey, tell man. us about the alto cumulus cloud. Of course, they look like they were almost deliberately laid out in a cool pattern. Explain that. Yeah, well, that's what's so striking about these are beautiful clouds, right? It's what's so striking about them is they have this layer. When they appear like this, it's a very regular layer spreading over a large area, lots of clumps called cloudlets with gaps in between. Uh, here you have a, a demonstration for us. I sure do. I'm going to show you. It's a kitchen demo. You know I like my kitchen demos. Here we are in the kitchen. So it involves a uh, one of these panini kind of toasters. You know these, right? And basically, you um, uh, this is going to re represent what happens to the air. All right? I've got some oil here. This is sunflower oil, and I've mixed into it some powder, mica powder, M-I-C-A. You can get it online. It's just a sort of sparkly powder that people use for crafts and stuff like that. And it helps us show the movement of the oil. And that's important because the way the oil moves is going to be the way the air moves up in the sky. Now, I'm going to turn this uh, sandwich toaster on, uh, and mm -hmm. it's going to start to gently heat the oil below. And you will see wow. the way that the oil rises is going to be in little uh, cells. They're called convection cells. As it begins to warm up, these cells are where the oil rises up and the cool oil above sinks down. Can you see them beginning to appear yes, there? Yes, yes. So these are the same, but you see the way it matches the cloud formation with the lots of the little um, clumps of cloud. It's the same thing is happening up in the sky. You get warmer air below the cloud layer, cooler air above the cloud layer. The air that wants to rise up, it rises up in pockets with the cooler air coming down in between. And so, you know, this, uh, oil, what's happening with the oil here in the sandwich toaster, it mirrors what's happening up in the sky. Dad, and that was so cool. For a while there, we had the side-by-side -side of your experiment along with the actual Alta Cumulus Cloud. It looks it's weird, though. They look the same, don't they? It's fantastic. Very cool. Great job, great demonstration. That's Gavin with Peter Penny from the Cloud Appreciation Society. And it's all because our atmosphere, like that panini toaster, it's heated from below. Yes. So it causes these convection cells, and it's a beautiful demonstration of what goes on. It's amazing. It really is amazing so cool. out there. So all right. Cool. We, we appreciate Gavin so much across the pond there in England. Uh, coming up here, we... So yeah, convection cells is what we would call those, um, uh, those kind of the way, it's just a way that if if air below wants to replace air above, it just can't do it all like that in one go. It has to do it, it has to sort of organize up bits and down bits. And that is the kind of beauty, the emergent beauty of uh, air can be revealed um, by the, these movements are revealed by the, the appearance of the outer cumulus clouds. And uh, that's the, what the regularity comes about. It's just like these cells the self-organization of the movements of air. Um, we uh, had someone send in a, um, uh, a, this, 
uh, one of our members sent it, said, I saw some alto cumulus clouds. Um, <laughs> and uh, she was kind of joking, of course, as she saw it over breakfast, saw them over breakfast. But actually, when you think about it, the same thing going on here. And got this kind of froth on the top of her, I think it's a cup of tea, actually, um, being here. She's a member in the UK, as you'd expect. It's a cup of tea, not a cup of coffee. Um, but uh, she's got this, um, like, there's a slight froth on the top of the tea there, and it's cooling on top and warmer below. And the movements of convection of the cooler surface tea sun sinking as warmer um, water comes from beneath. Again, it sort of arranged itself into similar kind of alto cumulus pattern. It slightly reminds me of that uh, Carly Simon song. Um, what is it? Uh, clouds in my coffee? Is it clouds in my coffee? So this is a kind of UK version of that. Um, whoever knew that Carly Simon was uh, a fan of convection cells? Not me. So that was um, alto cumulus. Um, let's move on to a different one. Let's go on to a high cloud. It's another of these 10 main cloud types. And I'm going to soon be moving on to some let not sort of more specific ones and unusual ones. But this, the cirrus cloud up there in the top left, is the one I wanted to talk about next. It's one of my favorite cloud formations out of the 10 main types. Um, it's a high cloud, looks like this. Beautiful brush strokes across the blue, stretching out um, in these different, very, what's the word for it? I suppose it's sort of um, evocative painterly appearance to this cloud. It's made of ice crystals. So this is an example of the cloud not being made of water droplets like those low cumulus, and actually often like the alto cumulus ones that were the small version, the clumpy regular version, this cloud is made of ice crystals. Um, and that's generally the case for higher clouds. These ice crystals tumble from the upper reaches of the troposphere. The troposphere is a part of our atmosphere where weather happens. Um, and as the ice crystals, so that they're, they're tumbling from up there around the cruising altitude of aircraft, I guess you would put it. Um, when they fall from there, they pass through differing winds. So as these ice crystals descend, well, if the wind speeds up or slows down um, in their descent, then the ice uh, crystals, this kind of strokes of the ice crystals will appear to kind of go forward and back. And so these ice crystals, as they tumble, will be sped up or slowed down as they, as they fall. And that's what often gives this cloud the, the, um, the appearance of, of a kind of brush stroke, this kind of fluid appearance to it. Um, it is the famous, uh, no, it is the, the sort of, it was the favored cloud formation of Edward Hopper. Um, and uh, Edward Hopper always actually liked to paint high clouds. It was uh, quite rare for him to paint um, low cloud formations, did it once or twice, but he really liked these, um, these high ones uh, when he did include uh, clouds in his paintings. These are cirrus clouds here. And in fact, these ones kind of have this appearance of a, a like a strip of cirrus going across the sky. Well, you probably call them jet stream cirrus, actually. Jet stream cirrus are uh, when they are, they're formed because uh, ice crystals are formed in the jet stream. And that can kind of mean you get streaks of cirrus going right across the sky, like in a huge, um, you know, highway, um, uh, freeway across the, across the sky. Um, so it could be that, I'm not too sure. He wasn't concentrating on uh, the clouds particularly. I always like looking at uh, paintings with a view of uh, cloud spotting because you're sort of reversing the, uh, the intended subject uh, from the artist uh, and looking at how they've expressed the background in most cases. It's a really a um, fascinating way or a fascinating lens through which to look at the history of art and in particular, our 
changing relationship with nature um, as expressed through the sky, the omnipresent um, cameo appearance of the sky uh, in art. So yeah, that was um, Edward Hopper's favorite uh, cloud time, I would say, probably. Um, you can see it has this, um, sometimes this hooked appearance to it. That's name, no, it's got a name. Of course, it's got a Latin name, Sirius, um, Sirius, this hooked one. It's called Sirius Uncinus, which is a Latin for hooked. Uncinus, weird name. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's something, um, you know, typically, uh, what's the word for it? There's, a, there's typically a kind of optical illusion going on here as is so often the case with clouds. Optical illusions is where nature uh, has, there's so many kind of uh, optical illusions when it comes to this part of nature. And uh, the optical illusion here really is um, uh, to do with the direction of the wind. So if you look at this cloud, it looks like the wind is kind of blowing that way, right? Um, it looks like the, the ice crystals are falling and then kind of getting picked up by the wind and then whoosh, that way. Actually, the wind is blowing that way. Um, and, uh, and the reason is because winds tend to be faster, higher up, and they tend to get just this is totally on average, they tend to get slower and slower the, the nearer you get to the surface. That's an absolute sort of generalization. But generally speaking, that's the case. And so what that means is that the part up at the top where the ice crystals are starting to fall from is when they're going fastest. And as they descend, they fall into slower winds. There's this kind of abrupt difference in the speed of the wind that gives it this hooked appearance. As you can see here in the time lapse, it's going they, 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 the ice crystals are falling and then they fall into winds. The whole lot is moving across to the right there. But as you go to the lower uh, winds, it slows down a bit. And that's what gives it this hooked appearance. We describe them as um, mare's tails. Uh, and the mare's tails is that uh, there's that phrase, isn't there? You know, um, uh, uh, you know, mare's tails making ships carry low sails because these are associated uh, uh, with sometimes with a change in the weather, the arrival of a weather front, which can bring a deterioration in the weather or perhaps stormier or, or rain or precipitation. And that is because these clouds, these hooked clouds show something about the winds. They show, as we saw that the winds fast and then suddenly go slower. Uh, uh, it's a shearing wind effect faster and then suddenly slower a little bit down. And that is just a wind pattern associated with the arrival of a weather front on its way. So that's why this hooked appearance, the mare's tail appearance of Cirrus, if you see those dominating the sky there, uh, can be an indication of a shift in the weather to come. Um, and so here we go, let's just see. So. Um, yeah, the cirrus cloud is actually named after the Latin for a lock, uh, a lock of hair. Um, is uh, That's what cirrus means in Latin, a, a lock or a curl of hair. So these Latin names, they are a bit sort of, sort of off-putting to people at first, but actually they are nothing more than us quite a lot of the time just saying what the cloud looks like. It's just that idea of finding shapes in the clouds. We just say it in Latin to make us sound more grown up and, uh, you know, like official um, when we do this naming. Uh, but quite often it is nothing more fancy than saying, eh, looks a bit like kind of wavy hair in the wind. And that's what cirrus means. The idea of finding shapes in the clouds, therefore, is actually central, not only to the pleasure of cloud spotting, but also to the science of cloud classification. Ever since in 1802, an Englishman called Luke Howard first named the clouds and came up with the names Cirrus and Cumulus and Stratus. So this naming uh, uh, associated with finding shapes, well, 
you know, it is a reminder of the pleasure of finding shapes in the clouds. We love it when people send in to the Cloud Appreciation Society clouds that look like things. Um, in particular, uh, uh, it's a sort of particular part of cloud spotting that I think is good because it's lighthearted. It is a reminder of the being a kid again uh, and the pleasure of finding shapes in the clouds. So yeah, whenever someone sends in a cloud in the shape of something, it gives me pleasure. For instance, um, you know, here we've got a uh, skydiver over Hong Kong, um, sent in by Terence Pang there. We've got, um, what is this, a, a break dancer over Romania, doing kind of spinning nets, but spinning, busting moves or whatever you'd say. We've got uh, one of those gymnasts, you know, with the, with a ribbon uh, over Belgium there, um, in mid kind of routine. This is, of course, the bust of Queen Nefertiti, um, uh, spotted over Santa Clarita in California. We've got here um, an angel with a camcorder. I mean, I don't need to say these. I don't need to explain these, do I? You, of course you can see these. It's an old school camcorder, not one of the new ones. Um, uh, we're talking about kind of quite old technology there. Um, and since we've got uh, Halloween coming up in just a few days, here's a uh, witch on a broomstick over Sydney, of course. Animals. You know, people love to spot animals in the sky. Here we've got a hawk, um, you know, looking about to pounce on unsuspecting skiers, on looking for easy pickings on the blue slope there. Um, got a reindeer. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, you could get puns, couldn't you? I think they sent that in as a pun with spelt rain as in rain. Um, but anyway, there's a reindeer. Uh, here's a cat, a pussycat looking down on to the traffic, about to pounce. People love finding shapes of animals. Here's an elephant over Yosemite uh, National Park in California. And an elephant here over Phuket in Thailand. And here uh, over North Carolina is an elephant up on its hind legs. A lot of elephants, actually. Uh, here's one uh, squirting water um, over North Carolina. A pink elephant over the Netherlands. Why do we get so many elephants? I don't know, but elephants, I can say categorically, are the most frequently spotted animal in the, the clouds. At least I can say that based on the images that get sent in to us and that we put up on the Cloud Appreciation Society uh, photo gallery. I have wondered about why that would be the case. Why elephants more than any other animal? It's not like they are the most familiar animal, and as you, um, in India or Africa, um, they're iconic, I suppose, but I think there's other reasons. I think partly it might be to do that a little bit to do the meteorology. For instance, when a cumulus cloud builds up, and these are all, uh, a lot of these are cumulus clouds, because um, they're the ones that have crisp edges, so they're good for finding shapes in. When it builds up, um, uh, it grows up on this thermal, as I said before, building upwards in the sky. And then as that thermal, uh, or as that cloud begins to dissipate, sometimes, you know, parts of it dissipate away and parts of it are still building in the thermal. And I think you can end up with what is like a trunk um, as the cloud kind of um, maybe kind of decays a bit. You're still left with the trunk, which is sort of more to do with the vertical part of the, therm of the thermal. It could be that. Um, I also was interested to learn that um, there's a creation myth in India where they believe uh, this early Hindu myth that elephants created the universe um, and that there are these sort of uber elephants which were around at the beginning of time. They... Uh, were rather like clouds because they could change shape. These elephants that created the world, they could fly, they were white, uh, they had the power to bring rain. And when Hindus historically would um, pray to these uh, albino al elephants, which they thought revered as a result of this myth, I think, when they prayed to them, they would use the term mega, which is the Hindu for cloud. So there's an association in the mythology, uh, some 
mythologies in um, India and some religions in India to do with the association of elephants in, uh, and clouds. And maybe it is because what we've tapped into here with people finding elephants in the sky through the Cloud Appreciation Society is something that has always been the case in countries where elephants are something that's familiar. And that was the basis for that particular myth. Who knows? not me. Um, okay. And um, yeah, so here's a cloud. We're now going to go into the slightly more um, sort of specific ones. And here is a cloud that looks like something that is um, known. Uh, it looks like a UFO, of course. Um, it's called a lenticularis cloud. So this isn't one of the 10 main types. It is a sort of more specific formation. And because you can subdivide these 10 main types. And this one, Lenticularis, well, it looks like a UFO, of course. And um, it, the Latin name means a lentil. But of course, that is, it would have been much better if they'd called it, um, uh, you know, the Latin for a flying saucer. I guess no one knew the Latin for a flying saucer. Fair enough. Okay. Sometimes these uh, Lenticularis clouds can appear sort of stacked one above the other like that, um, you know, sort of it's like, it's actually got a French name, this pile d'assiette, stack of plates, or it's a French for your turn to do the washing up. So this stack of plates is a particular kind of form of lenticularis cloud. Um, and uh, sometimes it joins up or sometimes it's not so much discs that this cloud appears as, but more kind of lozenges or extended sort of um, kind of wavy lozenges, I suppose you would call it. Um, but the classic is the disc formation. So how does it form? Well, before I say that, I'm going to talk about an example that I spotted when I lived in Italy. I, I spent eight months living in Italy. Uh, in fact, it was around pretty central to the whole idea of um, starting the Cloud Appreciation Society. I lived in Italy and it was a break from the work I was doing before. When I was there, I began to miss uh, the clouds in the UK with all the blue skies when I was living in Rome. They do have an amazing storms building up at certain times of year, but there are lots of blue skies. I started missing them. Um, uh, missing the sky and it was really after coming back from my trip to Italy uh, and seeing clouds in the art there so much that I was sort of thinking oh, I should do something more sort of profound to do with uh, my interest in clouds and it's really not long after that that my friend asked me to give that talk so this is an important time in the um, formation of the society was being in Italy and look there I went to Assisi uh, and I saw the frescoes there by Piero della Francesca in um, the basilica there in um, no it's not Assisi it's in Arezzo sorry in Arezzo in, in Italy and I was like, wait a minute, look at that. Those aren't normal clouds. They're lenticularis clouds. He is a cloud spotter, Piero della Francesca. He should really be given a posthumous membership to the society. He had spotted um, these uh, lenticularis clouds. And, you know, I wondered, what, was that because of how they form? He grew up at the base of the Apennine Mountains. And that is how these clouds form in the Lee of Mountains. You have the mountain acting like an enormous um, obstacle to the flow of the wind. The wind flows along. It has to rise to pass over that obstacle. And in certain conditions, it takes this rising and dipping path downwind of the peak. And these clouds form at the crests of these waves. So, um, you know, I wondered whether because uh, he grew up at the base of the mountains, the Apennine Mountains in Italy, whether that's why Piero de la Francesca um, was uh, interested in these clouds and decided when everyone else was doing either blue skies or kind of very, fairly crude cumulus clouds, he was putting lenticularis clouds in his sky. Sometimes they can join up like that into this kind of, you know, lozenges within lozenges, uh, beautifully lit uh, in this case by the um, low sun. Okay, we're going to move on quickly because we haven't got too much longer. Carvum, I'm going to go to like some really weird types now. Carvum is a cloud that's also known as a fall stream hole it looks like someone's just cut a hole out of a um, cloud type it looks as if it's been uh, 
well, I someone with a cookie cutter. And not only that, there's a sort of trail. Like I say, it's known as a full streak hole. So you've got this hole and this streak of crystals falling below it. What's happening here is the um, uh, it's a mid-level cloud. It's an altocumulus cloud, and it has got very, very, very cold water droplets in it. They're known as super cooled. And in one region, they start to freeze. And when that freezing happens in one region, because all the droplets around are so cold, it spreads outwards in this sort of chain reaction because an ice crystal forms and that ice crystal acts as a seed onto which the super cooled droplets nearby want to freeze. So the freezing spreads outwards from one point. And what gets it started is often an aircraft flying up through this layer of supercooled droplets that sets the freezing off because the turbulence in the wing of the aircraft cools it just enough to push it over the edge and start the freezing or maybe particles in the exhaust of the aircraft act as tiny little um, seeds onto which the ice crystals can begin to form initially. I did another demo I'm quickly going to show you of this to the Weather Channel. Um, I know you um, are desperate to see another science demo. So here we go. I'm going to show you this one. Uh, this time it's talking about this idea of super cooled water um, that's getting ready to freeze at any moment. Um, and all it needs is a bit of ice in the in the vicinity for to get the thing for, for the freezing started. So here we go. A really beautiful, neat uh, demonstration that you can do in your own kitchen uh, to show this chain reaction of freezing. But you need to start with a bucket and a bunch of ice and some salt and some bottles of really pure water. So you might want mineral water or distilled water. You pour the salt into the bucket, uh, you put the water bottles in there, and you find that that salt will take the temperature down. You could put a, a thermometer in the bucket as well, and that will take the temperature down well below freezing. The salt will. Maybe when I did this before, it was minus eight Celsius, which is what, 18 Fahrenheit, something like that. 20 minutes later, you'll find the water will have cooled down to that temperature. And if it was really pure, it would have stayed liquid in a super cooled liquid state. Now, what you do is you take a tiny shaving of ice from your freezer and you just drop it in. And you'll see the ice should freeze in one go. Hopefully, if it's worked, if it's pure enough, freeze in one go is an amazing sight. And you've created in your kitchen there, all right, the exact same chain reaction of freezing that gives rise to this full streak hole cloud, all right? Up in the cloud, it starts freezing in one place, perhaps as some ice crystals fall from a cloud above, and this sets off a, a uh, this sets off a kind of chain reaction of spreading. And so next time you see a cloud like the May cloud of the month, the full streak hole, you'll know how it forms. That is fantastic. Woo! Gavin, you knocked our socks off, yes. Gavin. That was so fun. Gavin Preacher Penny, the founder of the Cloud Appreciation Society. Thanks so much for joining us on a Sunday morning and showing us a great. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Cut him off. <laughs> um, so. Um, yeah, so that so that, so it spreads out with the Carvum cloud, um, uh, and uh, that's just one of the many uh, more specific and unusual features. But listen, we can't uh, get to the end of this without talking about the mighty. Um, the mighty storm cloud, which is like the queen or king of clouds. It's the, um, the mighty beast of our atmosphere, and it's a cumulonimbus cloud there on the right-hand side, stretching all the way up. It goes through all the different layers of low, high, low, middle, and high clouds. The cumulonimbus has this um, majestic appearance to it. spreads outwards at the top in this um, kind of anvil or mushroom appearance. Um, it's what produces thunder and lightning and hail and um yeah look from a distance like that and it is um the kind of most architectural and monumental of cloud formations um it spreads outwards because it reaches a bit of uh, that top of that bit where weather happens the troposphere at the top of the troposphere the temperature changes a bit and clouds can't the sort of profile of the temperature changes clouds can't climb up any higher they can't really float up anymore so they just spread outwards underneath this invisible ceiling at the top of the troposphere as you can see here by this photograph from the international space station sometimes it can push up a little bit if it's a really strong storm push up a bit more but basically the cloud spreads outwards under the invisible ceiling there at the edges of um, cumulonimbus 
cloud, you can get all sorts of features uh, like Mama, which are these pouches of cloud that hang on the underside of that anvil, that spreading anvil. They look um, kind of apocalyptic when you see them lit from the low sun at an angle. But um, in fact, these tend to form to the rear of the storm. So when you see a mama in the sky above you, you know that the cumulonimbus, the big mighty storm cloud, is around often if they're dramatic ones, but it's perhaps not heading your way, perhaps it is pouring down over someone else somewhere over there. Um, and uh, unless another one's coming along, you've been spared the, um, the shower. Now, I just want to say quickly, finally, um, about almost finally about someone send it, sent in a, this photo to us some time back. Um, and it was, um, you know, I looked at it and I go, oh, weird wavy cloud, not too sure what to call it. Um, and then someone else sent one in as well. And I went, oh, it's, it's a, there is a term for wavy clouds. It's undulatus. Um, undulatus means wavy, but this uh, it didn't look like normal undulatus clouds. And I was a bit sort of a surprise or didn't quite know what to how to classify it put it that way we normally put them up on the uh, photo gallery having classified what type of cloud it is so slightly perturbed me and then every now and then another one would come in you know this one from wisconsin and uh, and i go there's another of those weird wavy clouds it looks like you're under the surface of the water maybe snorkeling and you're looking up and it's a turbulent um chaotic sort of surface sea surface on a on a rough day then one came in from Australia. Every now and then, one would come in. Sometimes they'd have these peaks. You see those kind of peaks like that um, coming down, or this one up here. These peaks were something that seemed um, distinctive about this cloud. Until after a while, I thought, wait a second. You know, if uh, there isn't any a proper name for this cloud in terms of there isn't a Latin term, maybe we need one. Maybe we need a new Latin name. Um, how do you go about proposing a new type of cloud? And I thought, mm, uh, well, I'll call up the uh, Royal Meteorological Society, uh, which I did here in the UK. And they said, OK, come on, let's have a look at your cloud. Bring it in. We'll see it. And I thought, well, before I bring it in and show them and say, I think this should be a new cloud type, I better come up with a Latin name. How do I come up with a Latin name for um, the cloud that uh, looks wavy like this? I thought, well, I'll call up my cousin Philip because cousin Philip is a Latin teacher at a high school. And I said, Philip, what's a good name uh, that I could use? What's sort of some Latin I could use to describe this cloud that looks wavy and um, turbulent, like a turbulent sea? And, uh, you know, it's kind of some, I don't know, as if you're looking at it from below. Philip said, Glacialis hiems aquilonibus aspirat andas. I said, Phil, that's very helpful, but it's never going to catch on as a name. It's much too long. He said, no, don't worry. It's a, a, a Virgil quote. It means the waves were roughened by the icy winter's northern gales. And there's a word in there, aspero. You may want to use something to do with that word. It means roughened, like used in the sea. So this name ended up being Asperitas. So the Asperitas cloud, I went along, um, spoke to the people at the Royal Meteorological Society. They said, yeah, but you would actually, if you want it to be named an official cloud type, it's the WMO, World Meteorological Organization. They're the only people who'll do it. And don't hold your breath. All right. Um, you know, they are the ones who publish this uh, book called the International Cloud Atlas. It's where all the official classifications are. The World Meteorological Organization, um, you know, they, uh, I don't know, they, um, they, ha they, they don't change this naming system very often. Um, and so I wouldn't get too excited. And I, um, they had, uh, uh, you know, I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll find some information. I put it in our app. We have, we have an iPhone app, and I thought you could uh, make the, um, you know, in it, you can, this is quite an old app now, we have got a better one now, but you could take pictures and say what cloud type it was. You get kind of stars and badges as you spot the different ones. And we've got, you know, like um, moderators who tell people whether they spotted them right or not, um, and all these different types. And I made, you can, you know, you get, there's a ranking. I've turned the aimless, um, pleasure of cloud spotting into a competitive sport. 
But I added in there Asperitas, the Asperitas cloud, even though it wasn't official. I thought, you know, it's not official. Let's see if anyone spots it. It doesn't matter if it's not official. My app, do what I want. Um, and so we put it in there and people did begin to um, spot the cloud. And we could, um, you got an award, like a badge if you spotted it. And we could show the WMO, these examples. You know, this is in Northern Europe, in France. And there's one and they took a picture of this cloud. And at the same time, a little bit later on, someone over there in Belgium took it. Uh, and we could get these examples of the cloud being spotted and then look into the science of it. The WMO eventually asked me along to the um, to speak at the um, International Meteorology Day. Uh, this is in 2017. Uh, you can see I do look a little nervous uh, at a WMO here. Um, and they asked me that because they added uh, in 2017 this cloud to the International uh, Cloud Atlas, the official term. It was the first new classification of cloud to be added uh, to the naming system since 1951. And so it is a, uh, a reminder that this kind of citizen science of people being united around the world uh, by an organization like the Cloud Appreciation Society can change uh, something as international and as official as uh, the this kind of old naming system of clouds that was first um, devised in 1802. Um, yeah, so just finally, mm, what else do I want to say? I really want to wind it up because we want to make sure we've got some space for um, cloud types. I'm just going to throw in a sort of space for some questions. I'm just going to throw in here a few um, nice ones that at the end, like the horseshoe vortex cloud looks like a horseshoe upside down um, and is very rare, very fleeting. If you see one of these, you should be um, uh, you should kind of be very proud of your cloud spotting abilities. Um, it forms on top of one of those thermals, like a twisting roll of cloud um, that as the thermal rise is it kind of carries on pushing this horizontal vortex. It's like a little kind of mini tornado on its side, but it gets pushed upwards in the middle by the thermal and ends up like a horseshoe. And then there's a the Kelvin Helmholtz cl wave cloud, which actually has a simpler name, Fluctus. Looks like a series of breaking waves curling one over the other, like ocean breakers um, and a rare and fleeting cloud caused by the winds shearing, faster wind above than below. Um, you can even get a gentle breeze over some fog can lift the cloud up and curl it over in these beautiful vortices. These rare clouds, um, it's important to remember that these rare clouds may make you think, I'm never going to see one like that. That's ridiculous. Actually, it's all about just paying attention to the sky. You can see rare and unusual formations daily if you're paying attention to what's happening in the little spaces in the sky and you know, the fluctus, the rare fluctus cloud, maybe rare and uh, unusual dominating the whole sky, but just uh, look at the top of a cumulus, that everyday cumulus cloud. And you might see, and it's not uncommon, the little curls of fluctus as a breeze blows across the thermal that causes that cloud lifting the tops and curling them over in the distinctive curls of the fluctus cloud. A reminder that, well, you don't need to um, be super lucky to be a cloud spotter and spot these clouds. You just need to be paying attention and open to the sky. Uh, we had a quote at the beginning of our um, book, A Cloud A Day book, and uh, I'm just going to say that right at the end, I think, actually. Um, the quote is by Rachel Carson. I know so many of you will be very familiar with Rachel Carson, um, a great environmental writer. She said, one way to open your eyes to unnoticed beauty is to ask yourself, what if I'd never seen this before? And what if I knew I would never see it again? Thank you very much.